This is AgGrad Live. We have all of the different segments within the cotton. The show that explores what it's really like to work in the ag industry. So making sure that we get policy and regulatory issues. Straight from the people who live it every day. Hey, AgGrad Nation, we are live. Uh, for many of you, you probably were expecting us to go live on the other broadcast that you saw scheduled and teed up. Uh, had a technical issue, so we had to launch a new broadcast, but hopefully you found us on the AgGrad page. Um, and if you're watching this later, you are still welcome to join, but hopefully uh, we can get some folks to join us live. If you do miss this uh, and watching videos on Facebook is not your thing, you can always watch this video as well as the other ones we do on our YouTube channel, which is just AgGrad or uh, through a podcast. We call the podcast AgGrad Live, and it's just the recording of these episodes if if podcasts are more your thing. Uh, very excited about t uh, today's interview. In fact, I've got to read off. He has three different titles. So one of the things we're going to talk about is how he stays so busy with all of these responsibilities. Uh, we have on the show Carl Benz, and Carl is the lead development officer at the School of Agricultural and Natural Sciences at the University of Maryland Eastern Shore and the executive, uh, or excuse me, the external director of the Farm Credit Foundation for Agricultural Advancement and the Manners National President-Elect. Carl, that's a mouthful. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being on here. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Tom. You, uh, it sounds like keep uh, very busy. So appreciate you making time for this. And um, I guess let's kind of, you know, start towards the beginning of where all of these activities are coming from. Obviously, the common thread there is agriculture. Uh, when, when did you first get interested or involved in agriculture? Well, I, well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. And so I don't actually come from a traditional ag background. Uh, believe it or not, I kind of stumbled into agriculture. Uh, so essentially, you know, I was a senior in high school. This was ooh, 2005, and I actually I was in the grocery store with my mom, and we bumped into a woman who happened to run a, a research fellowship program, uh, which is pretty standard at research institutions. And, and she said, hey, you know, I have a full scholarship available, uh, but I need you to study agriculture. So my mom just kind of looked at me and said, well, I guess we know what you're going to college for. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, so actually the research fellowship program, we had to come on campus maybe two months early for a bridge program. And I'll never forget uh, the first time I was actually on a true farm, uh, our farm manager who kind of led our research project, he actually came up uh, in the morning to kind of brief everybody and said, all right, guys, today we're going to collect some fecal samples. And uh, we specialize here at UMES in small ruminants. So we have a huge farm of goats and sheep. Uh, so he said, all right, we're going to collect some fecal samples. So I was like, okay, that's kind of gross. But, you know, whatever. We'll throw some, <laughs> throw some gloves on and, and get it done. And then he hands me this glove that kind of goes all the way up to my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and says, oh, no, you have to go get it. Uh, so uh, this gentleman proceeds to perform like a Mortal Kombat move on this goat. It's like finish him, <laughs> and I. <laughs> so you know that's the day I switched from animal science to ag business because, uh, you know, God bless our animal science and our veterinarians, uh, but that was not for me. Uh, I said I will learn how to sell this goat, but other than that, I, I'm good on on getting this intimate with these animals. Uh, but that was my first foray into the ag sector, kind of hardcore ag, and uh, it was uh, fascinating and shocking at the same time. I bet, but you, but you, <laughs> st you stuck with it. You stuck with ag business, and I yeah. guess uh, even though you know, obviously the initial motivation was the scholarship. You know, I don't know anybody who would pass that up. Uh, <laughs> right. But, but what made you stick with it? Uh, well, I began to see how important it was to actually know where our food comes from. And not only just know where your food comes from, but understand how impactful it is to not only our country, but to a global uh, food system. And, you know, I, I actually, I began to travel a lot more than my other uh, you know, classmates that were in other majors. It seemed like every time I would I'd say, hey, I have to go to this different ag conference, or I'm going to go travel here, or I'm going to the Manners National Conference. And I started meeting all these amazing people who are 
Uh, one thing I, I, I really appreciated was how down to earth everybody seemed to be in the ag sector. Hmm. Uh, you know, there was not a lot of pretentiousness. It was really kind of, hey, this is what I really like to do. Take it or leave it. But you know, it was a very uh, familial atmosphere. And I really liked that. Cool. And, and I think um, we've mentioned manners a couple times now. There's probably some people watching or listening that don't know what manners is. So you are the national president elect. So you're probably most qualified to explain it. So to somebody who's never heard of manners, what, uh, how would you describe it? Uh, so manners is a, a national society, a national nonprofit. Uh, we are a student leadership and professional development organization. Um, Focus in agricultural and natural sciences, but also trying to span the gap. Uh, so, you know, the acronym historically stands for Minorities in Agriculture, Natural Resources, and Related Sciences. Uh, where we're uh, extremely proud of the fact that we are broadening our scope and really attracting students, uh, one who may not ever even go into ag or natural resources, uh, but also uh, kind of pushing that conversation about uh, diversity and inclusion and bringing a lot of different people to the table. Uh, so we're set up just like any other kind of collegiate organization. We have chapters at most of your major uh, land grant universities around the country and a national professional officer team and a national student officer team spanning different members around the country. And so then what, what will your responsibility be as, uh, as national president elect? Uh, so this year is national president elect. Uh, well, when you're actually elected president, it's a three-year commitment. Uh, so this year I'm serving as national president-elect, which is essentially like a vice president. Mm. So it's my job to lead our student officer team and support our president's initiatives and the rest of the officer team. Uh, but then you kind of onboard as president, and then you serve another year as immediate past president in more of an advisory capacity. Oh, so it's like a, it's like a three-year commitment then? Yes. Okay. And uh, so I, I know as far as career advice goes, um, one of the messages that you like to share is, is kind of using this, this Superman analogy. So go, explain that to us for those uh, looking to advance themselves professionally. Okay. So I, I stumbled upon this uh, awesome uh, thought experiment. And there's a book called The Rise of Superman. Uh, I believe the gentleman's name is Stephen Kotler. Uh, I may be mispronouncing that. Uh, but uh, play along with me as we do this thought experiment. All right, so uh, who would who would you say is is Bruce Wayne's alter ego? Well, Bruce Wayne's alter ego is Batman. Batman. Yeah. All right, and I know I'm switching between Marvel and uh, you know the other genres, but who would you say is Peter Parker's alter ego? Oh, you're really testing me here. Peter Parker's Spider Man. Okay. And who would you say is Clark Kent's alter ego? Superman. All right. A lot of people think that, but that's actually incorrect. So uh, the I wasn't super familiar with the whole background of Superman, but essentially Superman is that's 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 his his name is Khalil or something like that. But basically, that is his original personality. He actually hmm. has to become Clark Kent. So Clark Kent is actually Superman's alter ego. And when you think about it from the perspective of, you know, why did he have to create this alter ego? Because he was extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, a, lot of the, our, a lot of folks did not understand how to deal with this superhuman being, so to speak. And they made this interesting corollary between, you know, a lot of us are actually Superman. We have these amazing s skills and capabilities, but we often feel pressured to kind of downplay those to make other people feel comfortable or unintimidated. And oftentimes I see that I, that was just mind blowing to me because I actually see that quite a lot. And, you know, we generally have these amazing skill sets, but we're kind of hesitant to put ourselves out there because, oh, I don't want to make this person feel uncomfortable or I don't want to seem like I'm bragging or coming off, you know, too aggressive. Hmm. Uh, so but a lot of times that leads to people kind of hiding their true authenticity. You know, they're trying to all right, I'm going to make myself be like this so I don't make anybody else feel uncomfortable. And that actually halts a lot of innovation in organizations. That's really cool. I I, I hadn't heard of the concept, have, have not read that book, but uh, that's really cool. I, I never never thought about that. And when when you'd mentioned, you know, kind of the Superman principle, I didn't know where you were going. So I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's really cool. So um, 
along with that, you know, I, I think some people are in, and I know I was like this a little bit where I was kind of like, I felt like I was sort of searching for where I, I knew I had an idea of maybe, you know, to use the Superman analogy, what, what my Superman, you know, uh, authentic self was, but I was kind of looking for where to apply it. And I, I felt like in my job, I sort of, uh, uh, was needing to play a part to an extent. So, I mean, what do you tell people that are kind of maybe looking for if they recognize what their skills are, where to apply them? Mm, that's a great question. And I guess I have to hark back to my ag business days when we're talking about, you know, exploiting scarcity. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I'll get into this later, but I, I'm, a lot of us in ag know that there actually are quite a lot of opportunities in ag. And uh, I'm going to expand to natural resources as well. But you know, one of the things that I find is, number one, people are choosing jobs instead of careers. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'm going to find something that's essentially going to pay the bills right now, but I'm not really passionate about the work I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, hey, I had to do that a couple of times before I found an actual career. But uh, I'm going to reference a book, which a lot of people have heard of and are really kind of living by is uh, Find Your Why or Start With Why. Mm -hmm. uh, by Simon Sinek and really kind of get into the core of not, you know, what, avoiding your what and your how, because oftentimes we get paralyzed by fear when we're like, all right, I have this awesome idea. I have this awesome thing that I really want to do, but I don't know how I'm, how I'm going to do it or mm -hmm. what it's going to take. But if you have a strong enough why that you'll figure out the how and the what. So, you know, one of those things is, you know, starting with kind of your core principle of what gets you excited every day. And also, uh, we often get caught up in the, the sense of confusing uh, a movement with productivity. And what <laughs> I mean by that yeah. is, you know, a lot of times we're moving around, we're doing all these things, but just being, being busy doesn't mean you're actually being productive. And... You, know, you have to kind of take a step back and say, all right, where can I focus my skill set where I'm actually going to be having an impact? Uh, it often sometimes seems today we actually are proud of how busy we are. And, you know, all right, well, I can't do this because I'm so busy. I can't do this because I'm too busy. And really it's more of I don't want to do this because it's not a high priority for me. But that's kind of the, the shell that we use to protect ourselves by saying we're too busy. So I would also encourage folks to kind of figure out what things can you focus your attention in on. And that, and that leads me to my third point of uh, exploiting the shortage. So, you know, if you're, and I actually use this example to pull in a lot of people into the ag sector that normally wouldn't come in. And I'll give you a perfect example. So, you know, I'll be at a career fair, all right, and I'll see you know, all the engineering majors will be lined up at the Northrop Grumman table. And there are 100 engineering majors waiting to talk to one recruiter from Northrop Grumman. And meanwhile, you might have, and I'm speaking on, from the East Coast perspective, so okay. don't, don't gasp when I say nobody's at the John Deere table. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> We've got plenty of Midwestern people on the show, yeah. so it's good. good to get someone from the East Coast there. Yeah, uh, so, you know, or I'll see a Purdue Farms, and, you know, they have this awesome table, and they're like, jobs, 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 please come to our table. Mm -hmm. But because they haven't been acclimated to what the agriculture industry actually has to offer, they'll go and wait in line for a very small percentage of the opportunity to talk to a recruiter. Uh, so, you know, I actually encourage students who may not already understand how many opportunities there are in ag. You know, if you're a finance major, if you're a computer science major, ag is desperate for these kind of technical skills right now. Hmm. But on top of that, you know, don't limit, don't box yourself into, all right, well, I'm ag business, so I can't do anything that has a job title with animal science or, oh, I really like policy, so I'm not touching anything that's near a lab. Uh, oftentimes, I see undergrads will box themselves in, cut themselves off from internship opportunities, full-time employment, because the job title literally doesn't say plant and soil science major associate or something, which I don't even know if that's a real job title. But uh, so those would be the, the key things I would say is, is really focus in on your why, what, what really energizes you, you know, ex exploiting that shortage and also 
you know, really getting outside of, you know, some of those traditional ways that you actually go and find a job. Yeah, no, I, I think those are, are right on. In fact, I, I see a, a lot of times, you know, a common th theme there too, with especially when you're talking about being so busy that you can't do things. Uh, it gets it gets down to like, you can be your own worst enemy. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you're convinced you're too busy to to do what's important, well then, you know, that's you getting in the way. That's, that's not your activities. Or if you're convinced that because you studied plant science, you can't go... Uh, pursue a job that might be related to technology, you know, that's your own mindset that's getting in your way. And I think that's, right. those are, those are really, really good, good tips. In fact, it, it gets back to also the Superman analogy of you're, you're kind of um, hiding your true self for this alter ego that maybe you're, maybe your lesser self. Well, when I, when we were set up this interview, I asked like if, you know, any stories that you would like to share with, with the audience. And one you mentioned uh, about someone named Johnny Taylor, and I, I don't know who Johnny Taylor is. So um, maybe you could tell me and everyone else the story of Johnny Taylor. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, Johnny Taylor is the, he's currently the CEO of the Society for Human Resource Managers, uh, also known as SHRM. Uh, but when I met him, he was the CEO of Thurgood Marshall uh, College Fund, which is a national nonprofit that supports all the public HBCUs in the country or historically black colleges and universities. Hmm. Uh, so you know, I have been campus coordinator for Thurgood Marshall College Fund for several years and I always would go to the conference. And Johnny is this real enthusiastic, just, um, you know, he gets on stage and just, you know, steals the show and it actually helped that organization uh, revitalize itself with some amazing programs and even was, um, critical in pulling into pulling the ag sector uh, really heavily into TMCF now. Hmm. Uh, so uh, when I decided to run for Manor's national president, I did what I call a leadership inventory. So I made a list of everybody who I had really high respect for, whether they be CEOs of a multinational company or, you know, your local community leader. Uh, and I wanted to kind of get their take on everything that all the leadership experiences they had. So one thing I'm really big on is, is modeling. So not one ray modeling, but you kind of find an archetype that you really like to see yourself as and find out what it, what it took them to kind of get where they got to. Hmm. So after many emails back and forth with his assistant, I was finally able to set up a phone call uh, with Johnny. And I was a little nervous because, you know, as far as I was concerned, this man is way ahead of his, you know, in his career path than I am. It's probably too busy to really talk to me. Uh, so he gives me a call while he's driving in his car one day. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm really busy, but I have a couple minutes if you want to chat. So I'm kind of beating around the bush, not being as direct as I should be. I, I actually wanted him to be my executive coach. And you know, he said, all right, hold on, hold on a second. I have to pick my sister up. And his sister gets in the car and we continue talking. And then somehow the connection gets dropped. So I'm like, oh, my God, I'm never going to get on the phone with this guy again. And he actually calls me back and says, hey, uh, my sister heard your voice while you were talking on the phone. And she said, is that the manners guy? <laughs> so he said, yeah, you remember last year when you did that presentation for this youth group? That woman was my sister. Oh, wow. Uh, so <laughs> and apparently she said, I, I, you know, I did an amazing presentation. And she kind of gave me all the kudos and said, you definitely need to work with this gentleman. So he said, hey, man, if my sister says you're cool. You're good with me. Uh, so he gave me his personal cell number. And, you know, we've barely been working on a, a, a fantastic relationship where I've been learning a lot. Uh, but to me, that was just like, whoa, you never know who knows who, who's related to who. And it just kind of was indicative of the fact that, you know, one, you can't be afraid to step up and do presentations in front of people. And number two, whether you're talking to 25 eighth graders or, you know, a board of directors, you still need to bring that same energy and enthusiasm every time. And just how important relationships really are is so critical and often undervalued, especially kind of I see in that early career stage where, um, Folks kind of students kind of have these expectations 
And when the reality kind of crushes those expectations, and oftentimes they haven't developed that network of people and kind of put themselves out there to be in a position to have an opportunity to talk to some people that could help advance your career or just personally. Uh, yeah. But that story was just, it was just so random that I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I didn't even remember presenting until I really sat back and thought about it. But you just never know what kind of things can benefit you down the road by bringing your A game every time. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and putting yourself out there. I think people want to have everything figured out before they put themselves out there. And it's good to prepare. And, it, you know, it, it's good to try to do the best you can, but you got to put yourself out there and you, you never know where it can lead. And so that's pretty cool. So I, I imagine he's your executive coach now. Is that right? <laughs> well, one of them. So, you know, that led me to say, all right, well, I actually looked at the list and, you know, I, I, uh, I actually am working with several people who I would consider are way too busy to work with me right now, uh, mm-hmm. kind of at that CEO or senior VP level. Um, but you'd be surprised if you're doing good work. I was actually very humbled by the fact that when I reached out to several of these people, they actually knew what kind of work I was doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and You know, you just never know, you know, this is the age where you kind of have to shamelessly self-promote, even if it makes you very uncomfortable. Uh, This is ever so noisy in the world these days with every, all kinds of media hitting us in the head every day. You have to find a way to break through all that with your positive message. Very cool. Carl, what's uh, the future hold for you? What are you looking forward to as you look, look ahead in your career? Well, one of the things that, well, first I'm actually headed to Poland in July. Oh, wow. Uh, so I'm in a program called Lead Maryland, and many of the land-grant universities around the country have a similar program uh, where you will, it's for professionals in the agricultural field, and essentially you tour around your state for a year or two years learning about the agricultural impacts on, on the economy, social and political issues, and then usually it culminates in some kind of international trip. So our class is going to Poland next week, Uh, But some of these international experiences, including the one I had last year, have really sparked my mind on how small the world really can be if you want it to be. Right. Uh, So, you know, one of the things I'm planning on doing is pushing manners to encourage, well, not encourage, but pushing manners internationally, where we're going to begin doing some international leadership summits in different countries. Uh, You know, and that's one of the personal passions of mine is... I connected with some amazing people every time I go overseas and it really changes your thought process when you kind of sit back and say, wow, I can literally get on WhatsApp and text somebody in Gambia right now and they can just text me right back. Or, you know, I can text somebody in Taiwan or send a Facebook message to somebody in Brazil and the world is just not as big as it used to be. And it really kind of makes you feel even more of a human being, if that makes any sense. Right. Yeah, for sure. Well, if, if someone's watching or listening and interested in manners or, or really any of the work you're doing, uh, is there a way they could maybe follow up with you after this broadcast? Uh, yeah, definitely. Social media wise, uh, I'm really big in, in, in LinkedIn. Go ahead and find me. I think LinkedIn is an amazing platform that's underutilized by early career professionals, yeah. uh, especially. Uh, you know, I wish I had LinkedIn 13 years ago. Right. Uh, <laughs> but you, know, you can find me on Twitter at, at Carl Benz Jr. And, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to connecting with some professionals and students. Anybody, I really, one of the things I'm really passionate about is connecting the right people with the right opportunities. Yeah. Uh, so that's just something that catalyzes me. Carl, well, I I think you've got an inspiring story. I mean, uh, senior in high school, no interest in agriculture, has opportunity for a scholarship, not only like follows through with that, but is giving back to the agriculture industry in, in so many ways. So I'm certainly glad you caught a passion for this industry and uh, appreciative for the amount of value you put out in the world. And I know it's going to serve you well in the future. So really, thank you for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Those of you who tuned in live, thank you for sticking around with Carl and I. Sorry for the technical issues to start today. Uh, But like I said, the top show, you can find us either here on Facebook, on YouTube, or on the AgGrad Live podcast. Uh, Thank you all. And we're going to be back with another show next week. 
Thank you for joining AgGrad Live. Visit aggrad.com, that's A-G-G-R-A-D, to join the community, create your profile, and learn more about careers in the agriculture industry.